So we're on the last Sunday of covering the Bread of Life discourse in John 6. Recall how four Sundays ago, we took a break from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, since we're on the year B cycle of scripture readings for Sunday Masses in Ordinary Time, this year is dedicated primarily to the Gospel of Mark. But with Mark have, being the shortest of the Gospels, we take a break in the summer and take a look at this central chapter on the Eucharist, John 6, for five straight Sundays, all right? This weekend is that fifth and thus last Sunday of the Bread of Life discourse. Now, because the assumption fell on a Sunday this year, last week, last weekend, we heard the readings for that solemnity. So we missed a crucial part of understanding this Sunday's gospel, which if you want to follow along, it's on page 230 uh, of your pew missal, 230. So today's gospel opens with verse 60, and you can read there, which it states, many of Jesus' disciples who were listening said this saying is hard. Who can accept it? So what exactly did Jesus just teach the disciples uh, that the disciples can't fathom who would actually believe it? Well, we have to go back, we have to back up to that reading that we missed before today's gospel passage. So part of what we missed last Sunday was this. The Jews quarreled among themselves and saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And then Jesus concludes, whoever eats this bread will live forever. So that's what the disciples were essentially, essentially responding to when they say, this saying is hard, who, who can accept it? Because if the meaning of consuming his body and blood was just symbolic or metaphoric, that would be a pretty easy it would be a pretty easy statement to accept, right? But Jesus' repeated insistence that he was speaking literally is why the ancient Jews would have such, found such words not only hard, but offensive, repulsive, right? Because, and Jesus recognized that. That's why we hear in the following verse, 61, since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, does this shock you? Because to, to drink blood was expressly forbidden in the book of Leviticus, much less human blood. Is Jesus seemingly diminishing once again the law of Moses? And out of all the places, he's, he's teaching this in a Jewish synagogue in Capernaum there. So to hear someone talk like this was offensive at a couple of levels. If you really think what, about what Jesus is saying at face value without the hindsight that we have in knowing how Jesus would fulfill this teaching in the institution of the Eucharist at the Last Supper, we probably would have thought the same thing. Oh, that's pretty gross, Jesus. That's, that's difficult to accept. And so as we hear after this teaching, many of Jesus' disciples leave him. Right? They stop following him because of this crazy talk. You know, some things don't change. There are, there are many today who follow Jesus initially, initially, but when they get to some of his more difficult te teachings that are hard to accept, in these days, particularly his moral teachings, then many begin deserting him or try fashioning a false image of Jesus more to their liking, right? Anyway, Jesus knew there would be some sort of fallout among his disciples because of that day's teaching. And yet he doesn't mince any words, right? He doesn't give any qualifications or try to keep followers from leaving by watering down what he just said, by explaining that he's only talking, you know, symbolically eating his flesh or metaphorically drinking his blood. That he, or he didn't even say what he would do at the Last Supper that would be able to fulfill this command in, in a not so graphic way. That, that Jesus isn't, ask, isn't asking us to be cannibals, right? So, in fact, instead of doing any of that, what does he do? He doubles down. 
Jesus brings up more radical claims, going back to his claim that he is divine and that he existed before the 30 years that people saw him walk on this earth. So he's, you know, uh, what exactly does he say? What if you were to see the Son of Man, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? So Jesus is saying he's not merely the son of Mary and uh, the craftsman Joseph. He's claiming for himself that son of man title that Daniel prophesied about, that it, and that in him they are beholding a, a theophany, that God is manifesting himself to his people in Jesus. That he would ascend, and that not only that, but he would ascend back to the heavenly father into that eternity, into the heavens. And it's in this context of Jesus' claim of his divinity that Jesus says, it is the spirit that gives life while the flesh is of no avail. In other words, this present world of the flesh is not all there is, right? There is a life to come, a life of the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit that will give you true life. That's what he means that it is the spirit that gives life. And when Jesus says, by contrast, the flesh is of no avail, he doesn't mean his own flesh that is his own body. Sometimes our Protestant brothers and sisters will try to use this verse to try to discount the truth that Jesus had just repeated over and over again to emphasize. So proof texting against Jesus' own words, that's not a good idea. Right? You have to look at the words in context. By the flesh being of no avail, Jesus is referring to this present material world that is in juxtaposition to that life of heaven to which the Son of Man will ascend. We see Jesus here use the flesh as opposed to my flesh, and in the, in the, he'll use it in the same way a couple of chapters later in J John chapter 8, referring to this passing world. So after he says all of this, Jesus concludes his bread of life discourse by saying, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. So Jesus predicts what was about to happen. Because of the difficulty of all that I've just claimed, my divinity, my preexistence before my earthly life at Nazareth, my promising you immortality to those who eat my flesh and drink my blood, my ascending back to the heavenly father because of how challenging all these teachings are, some of you won't believe, at least for now, and you'll walk away. And verse 66, right? Many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus doesn't try to stop him, right? Because the, the definitive revelation of his divinity was yet to come, right? He, he would make good on those prophecies and then, would that, then that would be the time to go out and share the good news. For now, the theodrama of the Paschal mystery was just beginning. But Jesus does use this occasion none, nonetheless to test the mettle of his closest disciples. Because in verse 67, we read, Jesus then said to the 12, you also want to leave? In other words, are you, are you going to take off too? There's a door, <laughs> right? Uh, and thank God for our first pope. As we know, people did, or Peter didn't always get things right, but he listened to the Holy Spirit on this one. Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and are convinced you're the Holy One of God. That means if you're the Holy One of God, what you say goes. I mean, we don't understand it right now. Seems a little crazy to us. It seems a little grotesque even. But hey, you're the man, <laughs> right? So, uh, bravo, Holy Father. He realizes the truth of what Jesus had just said. No one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. In other words, this truth of the real presence of Jesus' body and blood it's not something you figure out because you're smart. Realizing that truth is a heavenly grace. It's a gift of God himself. I mean, for sure, God offers that gift to everyone, but it doesn't take smarts to come to that truth. It takes humility and openness to the gift of receiving the gift. 
So the theodrama continues after this very dramatic day in the public ministry of Jesus. But because I have something else to share in this homily, that wraps up our look at the Bread of Life discourse. I want to encourage you to develop that relationship with our Eucharistic Lord by spending time, you know, like an hour of Eucharistic adoration at each week, if you don't do that practice already. Better yet, so that you don't let the less important things that press upon us distract you from that hour a week, uh, I invite you to sign up for an hour slot at our parish's adoration chapel on our St. Joseph campus. But on to informing you about the Big Jackson Regional Meeting next weekend on realigning resources for mission. It will be held at Lumen Christi Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. If you recall, realigning resources for mission, it's our big diocesan initiative that will affect the parochial landscape throughout the diocese. It's a major restructuring in which ev virtually every one of the current 72 parishes throughout our di Lansing Diocese will be affected in some way in order to better position every area in our diocese uh, to better engage in the work of mission and to cultivate uh, every faith community to be a community of missionary disciples. Right, what we don't want to do in facing the challenges ahead, such as declining mass attendance and declining number of priests, what we don't want to do is simply manage decline. All right, that's admitting defeat. We want to face those challenges head on. To use that battlefield analogy, we want to retreat to a line we can actually hold so that we can mount a counteroffensive, so that we can fight the good fight from a position of strength. Right? And that's not possible by maintaining the status quo. And so these changes have actually been years in the making. It really began back in 2012 with the bishop's pastoral letter, go announce the gospel of the Lord. And then the groundwork was laid in the following six years with those three diocesan assemblies. The last one of those diocesan assemblies was in 2018 when thousands of us throughout the diocese packed the Breslin Center our parish having the most in the Jackson region. Uh, then over a year in 2018 and 2019, we returned to listening to what the Lord wanted next. Remember that diocesan prayer that we prayed at every mass, every Sunday mass during that year of prayer. You probably remember some of the words of, to that prayer, right? Send your Holy Spirit to form our parish as a community of missionary disciples maybe you have forgotten it so uh and then it's, it's followed up teach us to hear teach us how to hear jesus to love jesus and to share your gift of salvation with everyone we meet all right i believe that the increased sense of community and increased sense of mission in our own parish in the last couple of years have been the fruit of that year of prayer but we believe even more fruit will be born over the next few years through this realigning resources for mission. So after two years of consulting the entire diocese, in this last two years, the RRM, Realigning Resources for Mission Committee, it's now at the tail end of formulating those recommendations, the objective of which is to fulfill the vision of each and every parish having both the necessary resources and the necessary leadership to answer the call of Jesus to go and make disciples in all the communities in our diocese. Sometimes a parish will have one and not the other, right? They'll have the necessary resources, but not the leadership, uh, or vice versa, or not have either. <laughs> so the RRM committee and the bishop's uh, staff combined to visit every parish in the diocese to get their initial feedback to our diocesan vision for parishes. Due to COVID, we were forced to do the majority of them virtually, but the survey feedback from every parishioner throughout the diocese was read and considered. Also last year on October 1st, we met with all the priests again to get their feedback on, our, on that same vision. And at the recommendation of the priests at that meeting, the RRM committee officially began formulating parish groupings with the goal that every parish in the diocese would have those sufficient resources, material and human, to fulfill the four major elements of the diocesan vision of, of, of healthy parishes, right? Parishes that are, number one, led by priests uh, striving for health 
and holiness, right? That's priest plural. It's when starts priests becoming loner priests out there without any support that they get into trouble. Number two, equip and empower uh, parishes that equip and empower parish staff comprised of the most competent people. I mean, not everybody has a Shane Slough and uh, the, the awesome staff that we have here at St. John, right? Number three, parishes that make and form missionary disciples uh, to be mission-oriented and, uh, and equipping our, our parishioners uh, to know how to accompany people in, in their journey of life, the people that God has placed in their lives. And number four, seek and, uh, parishes that seek the lost and serve the poor, right? Both materially and spiritually, right? Uh, to be not self-referential, but out in the community, reaching out just as Jesus did in his public ministry. So we at St. John, I mean, we are the body of Christ. So we're his body incarnated uh, for the world today. So we at St. John, fortunately, were on our way in fulfilling that vision for our parish, but there are many parishes in the diocese that are just struggling to get by. Um, so... That is what the pro proposed parish groupings seek to change throughout the entire diocese. As a result, there won't be a parish that is not in some way associated with its neighboring parishes and collaborating with those other parishes in the work of reaching out to the people and the, their community in the name of Jesus, right? I mean, we have three parishes here with five worship sites within two and a half miles of each other. I mean, that's unheard of throughout the diocese. <laughs> that, that, and, and then, but sometimes we can feel like it's worlds apart from, for, even though we're in the same community, right? So, um, and meanwhile, there's like large swaths of lands that are unserved by, uh, uh, you know, a priest in a Catholic church. There's like, for example, there's only one church in the entire Hillsdale County, right? So both priests and then lay staff have already spoken into these proposed parish groupings and meetings earlier this summer, and they have been substantially revised based on that feedback. The regional meetings that occur on August 29 will be the next opportunity for all the faithful of the diocese to speak into these proposed parish groupings, and then those parish groupings will be tweaked one final time before the recommendations are officially submitted to the bishop in October. So, if you want to know what other parish or parishes we may be grouped with and want to provide input regarding uh, those parish groupings, their viability, et cetera, come to that meeting August 29. More details can be found in the bulletin, including the link that you go to in order to RSVP for the event so that we know how many people to expect. If you're not technologically adept, call Ava at the office and you can give her the necessary info to register you. So that's a lot of information to receive all at once, so be sure to pick up your bulletin. Let's now prepare our hearts to receive the most precious gift of Jesus himself in the Eucharist.